But when I saw this body, uh, rather bizarrely, I was incredibly uplifted by it. But more on the aspect of that individual was doing something which fueled their soul. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode nine of Behind the Curtain in association with WeWork. Number nine. Right, so what is Behind the Curtain? For anyone who still doesn't know, it's a secret chat show where we've got two guests behind here that we're going to bring them up on stage now any minute. And we could not have done all these shows without a fantastic studio audience. So thank you so much for coming out. Big round of applause, guys. <laughs> also, we would not be able to do this without sponsors. So thank you so much, Sage. Thank you so much. Also, thank you to WeWork for allowing us to use this space. So thank you yeah, so much. Huge thank yeah. you to WeWork. <laughs> On to the secret guests. Yes. We've done are. things a little bit differently this time. Yes, we have. But we think you're going to really like it. One of our guests tonight is a philanthropist. He's an entrepreneur. And he's also an adventurer. He's a lot of things. Our second guest is also an adventurer. And he's a world record holder. Hmm, who could it be? It's going to be a great show, guys. Huge round of applause for Justin Packshaw. And Alex Staniforth. So come on in, guys. Come on in. <laughs> Justin, thank you so much, guys, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. We haven't seen you since 2016 in Chicago. No, I think you kicked me out in a straitjacket, didn't you? Mm. Well, near enough. Yeah, near yeah, enough, yeah. Anyway. No, that was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Long time. Too long, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So just before you guys come out, right, I said we're going to do things a little bit differently this time. Mark and I got thinking that building a business is, is an adventure, right? Yeah. And if, if you're not into adventure, you're not into risk, you must be, you know, starting a business isn't for you, right? right. So we wanted to get, get you two on the show tonight, but we wanted to find out where this, this taste for adventure came from, right? So Alex, tell us a bit about you in school and growing up and, and what that was like. Uh, yeah, I mean, long story really, it's uh, not... Well, you're not that old, so it's not that long a story. <laughs> well, exactly, 23. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess at uh, 23 now, it's, I guess it's been a busy few years, but I think in a nutshell, um, adventure in the outdoors became my way of overcoming life challenges, and, and still is, and trying to now take people on that, that journey as well. Yeah. Um, so kind of, I'm not an entrepreneur in that sense, I'm not kind of from a business background, but I uh, have learned many of the same lessons. And, and for me, uh, growing up was, was kind of quite challenging with uh, epilepsy, stammering, bullying, um, anxiety, low confidence, a lot of the things that a lot of young people are going through yeah. um, that wouldn't have, have corresponded to, to kind of going off and trying to climb Everest. Uh, I'll come on to that shortly. Um, <laughs> I've just bought the story, haven't I? No, nope, um, not at all. Everyone else. <laughs> and, and so basically since then, it, it, I, I kind of got into the outdoors by chance and, and found this confidence, this, this purpose I'd never had. With, with, with you know, the difficulties in school, right? Did that come from, because I think in some form, right? Unless you're a hard man like Justin. It's like everyone goes through some sort of bullying in school, I think, or it's just me. But um, I think everyone goes through some form of it, right? For no sure. one's, no one's sure. immune to it. Yeah. Did, did everything the, that you went through in school come from being bullied or was it the other way around where you were picked on for certain reasons? I think it all kind of combined together. It was a combination of you know, the epilepsy and that's quite, a, quite a, a terrifying thing for somebody to, to experience at yeah. such a young age. And ultimately, I had two choices. You know, there was the victim mindset or a victory mindset, you know, and I decided to, to fight back and, and the outdoors became my way of, of doing that, proving myself, proving the bullies wrong. And, um, Such a great story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. And then I guess ultimately just started to realise what I could overcome. Nothing was going to hold me back. And then so that was uh, kind of 13, 14 was when it all changed. And so 10 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm still on that journey, really. Was school a time for you that you just wanted to get out of there? Um, at times, yeah. I think yeah. Many young people would, I think, agree. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I, I could have been academic if I wanted to be, but I think for me, my, my purpose in life was, became much bigger. And, uh, you know, I was um, quite often found in the library sending sponsorship emails for expeditions rather than doing my A-levels. And uh, yeah. interestingly, being told by um, my head of year, you know, that, you know, uh, I was doing too much uh, adventures and, and outdoor stuff that was going to neglect my future. But Ultimately, um, now I'm getting paid to speak to schools and my school have never brought me back, so. Oh, they haven't? No, so, yeah. They um, will, they will. <laughs> After seeing this show, they will. Yeah, I'll exactly. talk with the rate for that, but um, <laughs> ultimately, yeah, I, I think it's, it's been a combination of, of things, but I think um, I wanted to, to make the biggest uh, contribution I could and to follow my own path, and school was, yeah. was trying to push me down this forced path, um, this conventional way, and that wasn't for me, really. What kind of student were you? Um, 
able but not willing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably um, like most of them, yeah. I guess, you know, um, expeditions became my, my kind of gap year project that, that never really ended. And uh, I've, I've always had kind of a normal kind of a, a normal upbringing. And, you know, uh, yeah. parents always brought me up to, to work hard for things in life, um, but were never going to kind of sign me a check. I was going to have to find a way I make one, really. And uh, as soon as I could leave sixth form with fairly decent A-levels, um, I, I, I then focused full time on, on making these ambitions a reality, really. What about you, Justin? Can you remember what you were can like? I, can I say something <laughs> about how amazing this is? Uh, yeah. You know, I think there's this move now away from conventional schooling. Yeah. And, you know, lots of people are sort of thinking about life skills and, you know, amazing entities like, you know, Duke of Edinburgh Awards and those sort of things, which, you know, this is an amazing story, you know, mm. going from a great struggle to suddenly finding liberation and being able to tell a really kind of cool story yeah. which is relevant and I think that uh, we really need this is a topic we need to really kind of bash home because it's important yeah uh, and you know I think that you learn so much but it's not just the learning it's what it does for your confidence and that that's I think where suddenly you can be a complete rock star whereas if you've taken a slightly different journey that might never have come to the forefront yeah, which, which no. is a shame. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I, my story is slightly different. I grew up in the Mediterranean. Uh, I'm the youngest of four kids, and I, and I always think, you know, siblings are a fantastic bedrock for shaping you because, one, you always aspire to grow up quicker, mm. um, and, two, you, you kind of, you've got the best role models, really. And yeah. so I was lucky because my folks were really into sailing, um, and so we... I kind of sailed before I could walk. And it's been my, you know, it's really sorted me out on what I wanted to do. And rather like Alex, I had a huge desire and drive and passion to want to go and see what I could do, yeah. what I could actually do. Um, and then that sort of manifested itself into, well, if, if I can go and do this, why can't we take other people and then let's see what we can do as a collective. Uh, and I love that. I love teams. I like, I like the aspect of um, camaraderie and, and uh, having a bit of a laugh, really. But yeah. in doing, in, in having a laugh, really feeling that you're achieving something. And then that, that can sort of split off into lots of cool things about um, telling a story, mm. raising money, uh, trying to inspire people. And I mean, obviously, you know, I, I'm in my 50s, so, so I'm many chapters ahead of Alex, but I'm sure when he's at my age, he will be telling the same sort of story, but from a slightly different perspective. Yeah. Because Alex, Alex actually started quite young. Like, what, what age were you when you started getting it? Because you were in the, the British Army. Yeah, I, I joined the Army, um, but I sort of was quite lucky because I sailed for Britain when I was very young. Okay. So I, well, very young. I mean, I grew up racing, so, so it was a sort of very easy thing for me to... Um, and my philanthropy thing started, I, we had a, uh, I had a dog and it got very ill, got this disease called lashimalitis. Um, and this is many moons ago. My mum was flying in this drug to keep, it was basically AIDS, flying in this drug to keep this dog alive. And eventually she rather sheepishly came up to me and she said, look, darling, you know, we can't keep doing this because, you know, it's too much money and he's going to die. And I said, well, how much is it? And she, she told me and I said, right, I'm going to try and raise some money. And I was about 12 and I sailed, we lived in Malta and I sailed a little boat around Malta by myself and raised a ton of money. And I thought, bloody hell, you know, this is, and that's manifested itself into a really interesting concept of philanthropy and human endeavor. And it's a brutally brilliant, powerful tool, which we're just starting to get into. And um, again, it's really, it's really cool. I mean, it's a fantastic yeah. time. There's lots of people wanting to sort of do things. And I think both of our stories are the same story in that it, it's really about, we all believe, we all dream, and it's about saying, I'm gonna go and do it, and whatever it is. And then if you start doing it, saying, right, let's do some good on the back of it. Mm. And um, that's a very good story to tell. What was what was your first? Uh, what would you consider your first adventure, Alex? You know, your first big, big one. Ah, oh, quick, quick question. Um, first girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be a challenge. Um, I think really um, the, the real game changer was doing the National Free Peach Challenge when I was sixteen. 
um, which is quite a common thing, you know, climbing Ben Nevis, Scarfell Pike and Snowdon. Um, that for me was the first big step as to what I could realise I could do. And I think prior to that, I'd just done a bit of UK hill walking and climbing and, and really fuel that fire. Um, but I should also mention before that, I think what it was actually, um, going even further back when I was about 13, I was on holiday in Turkey when I decided to try something called paragliding. Quite an extreme sport, involves jump, jumping off a mountain with a parachute. And I don't quite know where that, that urge came from because it wasn't typical of a, a very shy, nervous, you know, nervous kid having, you know, having panic attacks and things. Um, and, and that moment hanging like a, like a bird was, was just when the mindset sh kind of shifted as to I could overcome anything and what else could I do next? And, and so kept trying more outdoor sports. Um, and it was then that I kind of had the idea of climbing Everest. And You were 18 at the time, were you? On the first attempts, but... <clears throat> I was so, so kind of over the years, I kind of built up that outdoor um, kind of passion, trying to, trying to fulfill that and doing the three peaks at 16. Um, so that was kind of on my own. Um, obviously not the driving, my, step, you know, my stepdad did yeah. that, but um, that, that for me was at the time a massive challenge and um, led on to, to kind of then put, putting the plan in place because obviously climbing Everest, you need a lot more um, mountain just, just background. Go back. You were 18 at the time, right? So... Well, like, what were your parents thinking? Like, when you went back now, I've got an idea, and they're like, what, what's going on? And they're kind of like, I'm going to climb Everest. Because, like, it's probably the most dangerous thing you'll do ever, right? And you're, you're 18 at the time, you know? So it's really kind of like, what? What is that like? Well, I mean, over the years, I've, I've done kind of stuff in the Alps and then went to the Himalayas the year before to train more and more. Um, and so kind of they got used to it, kind of acclimatised in that way that I kind of went on to bigger peaks and got more and more prepared. But So they were kind of used to it, but um, I think any parent wouldn't stop their child doing what is important to them. But I remember my dad saying, you know, it's a lot of money to spend on a holiday. Um, some holiday it turned <laughs> out to be. And, I, and yeah, I mean, they've always been very supportive and very grateful for that. But um, I think I, I still remember, you know, all the, the difficulties they had and what I put them through. And, and you know, yeah. I felt very guilty for that. But at the same time, very grateful that, that they were behind the mission, really. Yeah, we, we definitely, Everest is something that's intrigued Mark and I for, for a long time. A friend of yours attempted to climb yeah. um, and, and didn't make it. And then and there's a guest in the, in the studio audience tonight who, who we also chatted as well. We find it so intriguing. Tell us a bit about the, the lead up to it. And did you, did you know in the lead up how dangerous it could be and the realities of it? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess as a young, you know, as a young person, I guess I was probably fairly naive to an extent, but I understood the risks and the chances and, and was willing to, to take those risks. I think it's a case of minimising them as, as best possible with the best support on the hill and the best prep. Um, but what happened, ironically, kind of threw that out, out the window, really. Yeah. Because, tell, tell us a bit about, about what happened. I mean, briefly... Um, in 2014, there was a big avalanche in the icefall, which sadly killed 16 climbing Sherpas um, just above base camp. So due to a, a load of politics and various various kind of scenarios, the expedition was cancelled. Uh, we went home without stepping foot on the mountain. So in, in other words, you know, we didn't get, uh, we didn't get well, we didn't get uh, above base camp. So all the, the work and prep was thrown out the window. Mm, yeah. uh, most importantly, of course, as the Sherpas always say, the biggest success is safety. Um, Took that as a year to, to train harder, to come back stronger. Went back in 2015. And that was when the Nepal earthquake hit, uh, when we were on the mountain itself. And I guess that really sums up risk for me is that, um, you know, sadly 20 people died um, yeah. down at base camp in a big avalanche caused by the earthquake. And ironically, base camp is normally the safest place to be. Um, but actually being on the mountain was the safest place to be. Mark, Mark and I hear a lot of stories about founders that go through building a business and then the business failing and them coming back and doing it again and people nearly end up homeless and losing spouses and, and everything. Terrible stories, right? You went to climb Everest and people actually lost their lives and you went home and thought, I'm going to train and do this again. What, what not in a bad way, but what goes through your mind that you're going to go back and do something? Because you could have been where they were, surely, if you yeah. were there earlier. I mean, yeah, it's, it's strange because when, you know, when, when the earthquake hit, we were in the place near enough where they were. And ironically, you know, we, you know, we came back safely. Um, base camp was what got whacked, and sadly, you know, you know, all the you know, all the climbers and Sherpas died at base camp where we, where we'd been that morning had we not left a few hours earlier. Yeah, I think 
like anything, it's, it's a case of there is risk all around us. And if we're not willing to take that first step of the mountain, then we're always going to be vulnerable. I think I just realised that the, you know, for me, the biggest risk was to, was to take no risk at all. Do you ever think back, like, because you could have been at base camp that yeah. day. Like, do you ever think back and I go, like, because it's something that go through everyone's head, mm. you know, especially like missing it by one day. You know, like, do you kind of think back on, oh my God, like I could have been there. Absolutely, of course, a lot, and you know, there's an, uh, an element of guilt to that. But I think yeah. it's just you realise how uncertain and how cruel life can be. And ultimately, we have to. We can see that in two ways. For me, it was just a way to to use that to to make the biggest contribution I could while while I'm here. Because yeah, um, I think I said you know if we if we knew what could go wrong, we'd never do anything. And ultimately, I think I was willing to take that risk and just minimise it as best I could. Justin, you climbed Everest, right, and, and you made it a peak. But you, you had done expeditions beforehand that were quite, quite extreme. Tell us a bit about the time you climbed Everest. But what you've done beforehand, do you feel that that readied you in any way, or can you be ready for something? I mean, look, risk. <clears throat> I mean, Alex is underplaying it. You know, it's a, it's a sort of uh, risk is a something which you will evaluate. Obviously, no one wants to. Um, be reckless mm. but a lot of these things are reckless I mean you know Everest the statistic on Everest it's a real statistic today is every tenth person who gets to the top um, one of them won't come home one in uh, ten <laughs> one in ten so oh, geez. you know when you uh, however you look at that in, in any statistic in anything in life get in your car and drive somewhere and there's a one in ten chance that you won't get there ten percent uh, you probably won't get in the car um, However, Alex is right in that you, if you don't look at these challenges and say, you know, I'm really prepared to take this on. And if yeah. I'm going to take it on, I'm going to make sure that I am super grown up. And, you know, you talk about businesses. It's the same kind of, you know, risk assessment. Do your preparation. Surround yourself in great people. The trouble with these kind of very big undertakings is you are going up against something which we have no control over, mm. which is Mother Nature. Yeah. And you've only um, got a gap as well, don't you? Like a, a, a certain. It's a tiny window. window. Yeah. It's a skinny, skinny window. I mean, listen, you've got you know, uh, you're up where jets are. We, I mean, we all see the stories or have seen the stories. Um, and once you once you commit to to go to the summit of Everest, you, you really are on a, a pretty tight deadline because yeah. if, if the weather comes in there's nowhere to hide there's not there's you you can't suddenly say oh, i'm going to duck down here and kind of you know i'm going to weather this that doesn't happen okay so you i mean we're living in an interesting time i mean all my trips are, i'm fascinated by old school explorers and have replicated several of them and they were really extraordinary and mm. it's only a hundred years ago i mean you know well everest wasn't climbed until 1953 um and i think to answer your question on how you prepare I mean, the only difference between Alex and I is that I've done a, more stuff, so I've had more experience as to the opportunity and how you take yeah. advantage of that. Mm. However, circumstance is circumstance. I mean, if I had tried to climb Everest on, in, on those two years, well, I wouldn't have got, we wouldn't have got to the top because, unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. Did you only attempt at the once? Yeah. You did? Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, you know, uh, as with all these things, I mean, no one is going to... We, we shouldn't go above 8,000 metres, as we well know. Um, and you will never, ever have a trip that just breezes up and breezes down. That doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, our trip, we climbed up from the north side, from the Tibetan side, and um, I mean, full of drama, fantastic drama. Though. And, and, you know, it's the making of all of us, this stuff. And I think what's amazing um, about Alex's story is to actually take part in that and witness it at such a young age is, and I'm sure, I mean, well, I, I'm sure you told me before, that will change you and it will change the course that you then go and sail on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the more that we can encourage people, whatever your Everest is, it doesn't really matter, um, to go and just kind of be a bit fearless and, and yeah. get stuck in, you will always come back a bigger person. Well, that, that's the thing, because like you, you were saying you used to suffer from a bit of anxiety and mm. for a number of different reasons, and then you attempted to do something like this, right? And I know you didn't get to the, to the peak, yeah, right? Yeah. But you still accomplished so much. Do you find now that it, for you it's so much easier, and for you as well, Justin, especially getting to the peak, that 
nothing else is, is difficult or you'll find everything else. I won't say it's a breeze, but you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's, you climbed Everest and you attempt to climb Everest. Mm. You know, like now things are, ah, yeah, of course. Yeah. What, speak in front of 20 people? No problem. <laughs> you know, speak in front of a thousand people? Yeah, no problem. Is it like that now or? Um, I think every challenge is different. I think, yeah. you know, I saw, a, you know, you know, I mean, I saw, a, you know, later on, I mean, I saw a, uh, you know, I saw a friend for lunch. I mean, we were on Everest together both years and then, Another peak in, uh, in Tibet in 2016, and um, so obviously we've, we've both been through the same experiences. And he he summited Everest last year, um, and I asked him, you know, what's next? And he's kind of in this place now where he can't find the, the next, next challenge. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, it you know, obviously I would love to reach the top, um, but what I've been able to take from that is, is the journey and what you learn along the way. And ultimately, I think. We're, we're, we're always trying to chase that one big thing in life. And I think what, I, well, what I've learned is that it, it's, it, it literally is what we learn along the way. Um, and I'm actually quite, obviously, would have wished that what happened didn't happen. Yeah. Um, mm. But I feel grateful to have had that experience so, so young because it just makes you realise what's important in life. And think, to take the, yeah, to kind of take uh, the I think you climb something bigger than ever, so, uh, oddly. And failure is a, is a brilliant stepping stone Yeah. Uh, to, to actually propel you somewhere else. I mean, what, what did Churchill say? You know, success is going from failure to failure yeah. without loss of enthusiasm. And it's a really true point. You know, you, you yeah. kind of, I mean, Christ almighty, we all fail. You know, you, we, you know life is about failing. Mm. But the smart people only really fail once. And, you know, and I mean that metaphorically, in, in that you will, at some stage, I'll put money on it, I'll put my house on it, you'll climb Everest. And, and you, again, you just have to marginalise it, and it's, you know, but the fact of the matter is, if you go and do anything, and you are myopically driven on the end goal, which happens most of the time, um, then that's, that's a shame. Yeah, because yeah. The, 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 journey. The, jour yeah. the journey is really what it is all about. And all the trips I do, um, if I'm really brutally honest, as soon as I have an idea, that's when I start salivating. And, and it's the aspect of putting meat on an idea and then getting to the start line, which is what I really enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, that's the truth. Um, and I think that if we can hopefully inspire anybody to say, you know what, I have been really dreaming about this, but it's so suppressed and it's yeah. so deep and I'm so caught up in my whatever the, your rat race is, um, but actually I'm going to bring that to the forefront. A lot, of people, a lot of people want to know like, um, what it's like at, like at the top and what it's like, like nearly getting to the top because it's pretty mundane where it's just like you're focusing on one step after another and that's all you can focus on because your body you know, stops working and everything becomes a chore, breathing becomes a chore you know, walking is difficult to do, you know, so what is it like to keep going? Because you, you do come across different things, which we've yeah. heard in the past, which is, you know, people have, that haven't made it off, um, haven't made it off Everest. Is that something that, like, do you even have the mental power to get freaked out? That's one for Justin. Everest is, is littered with dead bodies. That's okay. we, we went down, when you two were coming in the show, we went down mm. this crazy rabbit hole of, just reading stories and, and articles about people who've climbed Everest. I mean, you, you, uh, and not in any way being blasé about it, but, you know, there's, you know, green boots, no sleeves, uh, one ear, you know, where yeah. are you? I'm at green boots, I'm at no... And the strange but for green, thing... for anyone that's watching that doesn't know what green boots is... Well, it's just a person who's got green yeah. boots and who's died. And, okay. And, and um, you're, you know, I, I, when I climbed Everest, I, I had young children and... Okay. Um, my wife, who, bless her, has really had to put up with a lot with me. And she, when we got married, she made me promise that I wouldn't climb Everett because she knew I wanted to. And I kind of worked a fairly clever old Irish jib on her. And eventually <laughs> I did. And um, it was funny because you, at some stage, we were a team of ten. Okay. And so we would all look around each other uh, and I suppose subconsciously you would think, you know, there is a chance that one of us might be going to one of our mates and saying, you know, yeah. I'm so sorry, you know. And when I first saw um, one of the dead bodies, uh, a very strange thing happened. And it was the complete opposite of what I thought would happen because your mortality is your mortality. And I had witnessed some of this. I've been a soldier. I've been to several wars. And, um, but when I saw this body... 
rather bizarrely, I was incredibly uplifted by it. And not uplifted about the sadness of the loss, because that loss is really about what's left behind. You know, grieving families, yeah. unanswered questions, all of that stuff. But more on the aspect of that individual was doing something which fueled their soul, which okay. drove them and made them do something. And it's seriously beautiful. I mean, you are, you know, you're halfway upstairs already. And I was really surprised by that, actually. And I don't mean that in a, in a flippant way at all, because, you know, life is to be valued and life is to be led. Mm. But it, it, if it's not led to its fullest, then in a funny way, I don't really recognise that, yeah. me as a person. And if my children, who are, who are young and they're full of determination, were to say to me, I wanted to go and do something like this, anything with high odds, I'd be really thrilled. And I'd be thrilled in that they feel that they have the confidence to do it. And then, hopefully, that they have the ability to understand, like Alex, that I'm going to do my homework and I'm going to work bloody hard. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that when I'm there, I'm a thoroughbred. And that is the, that if you're going to play in that field, then it doesn't have to be in that field. But if you are going to play in that field, you have to make sure you do that. Because otherwise, it will chew you up. Yeah, sure. yeah. We, we we did read an article about someone who was preparing to climb Everest, and they with their mates, right? And they all raised money and they're all going off together. And they said that if, if one of their friends, if someone you're climbing with stops at a certain altitude, you can't stop and help or bring them along. Is that is that true? It depends where you're on the mountain. I mean, a lot mm. higher up. Um, I mean, I haven't been above uh, seven thousand meters, so still, which is still a long way to go. And yeah. Even at that altitude, you know, it's it, it's like a, a, a pain you've never really um, you can't describe. It's, it's on just, your skin, it's, on your just muscles. everywhere. Or... It's just this exhaustion, um, and even putting your boots on, you know, even getting up, putting on the stove, it just takes so long. And although I haven't obviously been above that, I could I can completely understand anybody higher than that on summit day after. 14, 15 hours on the go, uh, just how difficult it would be to actually take the focus of getting yourself down safety. Um, yeah. Mm. You know, to actually to, to actually help somebody to get them off the hill if they were unable to would take a lot of Sherpas to actually get them back down again. Um, yeah. And so I could completely understand as to, as to how difficult that would be. I mean, again, you know, the guys who have been that high and just to, to know just how it feels to be at 8,000 metres, but I could... I could I could understand that, and so you get a lot of the press saying about how you know people kind of left it there to die. But I think ultimately the people that made those calls had to put their own survival first. Yeah, of um, course. Any thoughts on that, Justin, from your experience? You know, above eight thousand meters, there's a third as much oxygen. There's a third as much air. So there's a third as much oxygen. So you take a big gulp of air, uh, and you're working hard, and okay. your body goes, okay, so. I don't have very much oxygen to play with here. So what am I going to do with it? And the first thing is, is your brain, the decision maker, needs a chunk. Uh, and then it says, OK, my heart and lungs need a chunk uh, because they are driving this all through. Yeah. And then my digestive system needs a chunk because it's what's fueling everything. Yeah. And the next big one is muscle. And there isn't enough. So above 8,000 metres, you lose a kilogram of muscle a day. Wow. Not fat, muscle. It just like yeah. strips it off you. And <clears throat> to sort of weather your way through that, what happens is you become slightly myopic on the end goal. And that's part of the problem why there are so many fatalities. So if a team member has a problem, which can happen, cerebral edema or a or, or something similar. Um, you hope what you will do is say, OK, I can see the summit there, yeah. but I value your life much more, and I'm going to me and around my team, down. we're going to yeah. get you off. Mm. Now, uh, as a sailor, there is an unwritten rule. If you were sailing, I, I've sailed around the world, raced around the world, and if there is an issue with any boat, and they put out a mayday call, every yeah. boat around will turn around and go and help. It's an unwritten, that is what happens. Okay. On these big mountains, 
It's not like that. These rules aren't, it's sketchy. So that scenario, hopefully what will happen, and you know, our team, what would happen is we rally round, you get that yeah, person. Yeah. But what happens if it's someone else's team? And it's someone, else's, someone else in someone else's team? Do you sort of go, hey, well, hold on, uh, you're not my responsibility. Mm. Uh, and you know, I've got my oxygen, I've got this, and I'm gonna step over you, and I mean, you're so buggered. So it's a very tricky and difficult question. To me, it's not tricky at all. A life is a life, and yeah. that, a mountain you can climb at any time. And, however, there are many stories <laughs> of people stepping over people, mm, many. Okay. It's, there it's, are also many heroic stories, actually, of, of people doing fantastic stuff. It's interesting, Alex, because you, you, we had spoken before, and, and, and obviously I watched your, your, your TED talk and, um, before the show. Yeah, yeah. You had said that you, you, know, you, you want to find your own Everest, right? And, and, and Everest isn't Everest to you anymore. Justin has just bet his house, which is really interesting, because I bet it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> right? on, on, he, he will bet that you will climb Everest again. Do you think you will? Um, my mum's not here tonight, so I could probably talk about it more openly. She might watch um, it Monday. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. there you go. Um, I think I think just to kind of touch on the point before is in terms of what else it is, what you know, what else Everest has brought me, and those experiences were were life changing in a very positive way. I, I could have come back and viewed them as a negative, you know, poor me, I was there, but, but you know, caught in the two biggest you know uh, Everest disasters in history, um, and some people have come back and with, with with that mindset. Um, but for me, I'm very fortunate now that I'm able to speak about it, to take people on that journey and share what I've learned. And I think, to touch on your point before, mm. it, it doesn't necessarily make things easier, but um, it, it, being in such a, a beautiful country with people that have so little, that, that would give so much, you know, you hear people complaining because the bus is 10 minutes late or because of, you know, Brexit or all this yeah. stuff going on in the world. And you, you see people that are so happy and so resilient and it makes you just appreciate what's important. I think that, it, it certainly makes you more resilient to everyday life. Mm. Now, on a personal basis, you know, on a mental health basis, it doesn't make me immune to things. I've still had days when to find motivation for a 5K run is, has been my Everest for the day. And this is, this is when you start to pit yourself thinking, but I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. But it's not always, you know, relevant. Yeah. You know, it's not always relative. Um, but ultimately, it's, I think, like an adventurer, we, we always want to, to find what else we can overcome. And... We just have to accept that there's always going to be the natural peaks and troughs. We're always going to have those challenging days. But I think ultimately, um, it, it it does make you appreciate life more, and also yeah. able to realise, especially with what happened, um, why it's so important that we, we we do get out there, we do try these things, we do live life on our terms. And so, to answer your question, I think I've been able to gain so much more from it, and and, and hopefully give back along the way. But mm. I don't really Everest was just a step on the journey, but. There is something in me still there. Something, <laughs> there was something in there to drive yeah. me there in the first place. And from being a 14-year-old kid, thinking he could take on you know, this massive peak on top of the world. Um, and my challenge in 2017, climb the UK, uh, and the challenges I've got planned this year, will, will be difficult phys- you know, from a physical and mental point of view, just the same way that I think I can get that same kick. But I think I, I would just say... Um, Maybe someday, you know, but for now, it's just a case of trying to, to, to make the biggest difference I can. But uh, I'm, I'm too young to say never, but I think it's just, uh, if anybody's thinking of uh, climbing Everest, just don't climb it when I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I want to say is just, you know, keep tuned and follow the journey. That's I wanted to ask you as well, because um, we had a quick chat backstage, and, you know, you were telling that you always found it hard to climatise at altitudes. Did you think, uh, being a young guy, that you'd have, uh, it would be a lot easier for you. Because I know, Justin, you were telling us as well backstage that uh, the prime age to climb Everest yeah. is when you're 45. Yeah. You know, so did you, did you go in thinking, yeah, I'm a young lad, this is going to be fine? There is a risk of that. And I think some people say that young climbers do tend to almost struggle because they go in with this expectation. Yeah. And the mountain doesn't work that way. You mm. know, the mountain doesn't care how hard you've trained or how much you know, you've spent. Um, and despite, you know, my you know, my youth and fitness and training and everything else, um, you know, there's some days you're thinking, how the hell am I going to climb that when you feel like this down here? Yeah. And I did struggle to acclimatise. And on Choa Yu, which is the sixth highest peak in the world, which I, I, tr- I climbed, well, tried to climb um, two years ago, um, my blood oxygen got down to 54%, which was the second lowest our basement manager had ever seen. Okay. Um, and was very nearly evacuated. Now, luckily, he did recover. 
And, um, and yeah, I've always struggled. And I think ultimately uh, the people that they do well are the ones that are just completely unflappable. They take it one day at a time. And so if I was to go back, I think I would wait till I'm a bit, a bit older. Um, young people do tend to go off too fast. I don't think that I did that, but I think almost they, they, they think they fit and they go off too fast and they're yeah. the first one to get ill. Um, and again, just be able to take, take your time and um, not overexert yourself. I think it's, but I've, I've always found it's the, it's the mindset that's most important. Um, you know, the engine is only as good as the steering wheel. I like that saying, stealing that. Just, we're, we're, we're near enough running out of time, right? But, but we want to find out is there's, there's entrepreneurs watching this show. Mm. They go through struggles every single day, right? And, and as you said earlier on, everyone has their own, their own Everest, right? So what, what piece of advice would you give to people watching that wake up and think, like you said, oh, I'm struggling to do a 5K run or I've struggled to do these six meetings in a row or to build my business or to raise money and people think that they, they have these huge challenges ahead daily. What, what advice would you give? I mean, again, not as an entrepreneur myself, I think mm. what you said is, is true, true that we all have our own challenges and, and they're all relative to our own experiences. Um, I think it was, is not to worry about things that haven't happened yet. Um, and I still do that every day. You know, <laughs> things suddenly all seem to go wrong at once and then the day after suddenly you're on a different mountain and, and you can see the, you know, you can see the, you know, you, you, know, you can see the top all of a sudden and yeah. it's a bright sunny day. I think it's, it's that and also the ability that we are capable of so much more than we do realise. But I think we just have to keep moving forwards, no matter how slowly, just keep momentum. Um, I think when you stop, it's a lot harder to carry on um, than it is to, um, you know, just keep on moving in the first place. What about you, Justin? What's, what's next in store for you? You've sailed around the world, you've climbed Everest, you've gotten to the peak of Everest. What's next for you? What's your, your next mountain? Uh... I'm sort of slightly changing my... I mean, listen, I, I love, um, as I said, I, li I like the idea of having a challenge. I think yeah. it, and it, it brings the best out of me. Uh, I've definitely moved from that egotistical aspect of kind of driving myself uh, as I'm hitting a, a sort of slightly different era in my life. Uh, I really love watching other people come to that fruition. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by this thing about philanthropy and, and doing trips, and um, I'm going to do a lot more of that, uh, and hopefully raise awareness and and money for really important things. Um, and I think that's a very exciting thing that we can do now. Yes, uh, I've got a couple of fun trips, really fun, quite punchy trips, um, which I'd like to do. Uh, but yeah, I think more about telling the story, trying to inspire people to. Uh, follow their dreams, be their best. Uh, you know, humans are meant to excel. We're an amazingly brilliant piece of kit. Um, and you have to nurture that. Yeah. And you have to sometimes bully it and say, this is what I'm going to do and this is why I'm going to do it. And um, if we can just get everyone doing that and then if we're clever, get them all doing it in the same direction, we will absolutely make huge change. And um, I just think it's a fantastic message. Uh, and people, rather bizarrely, my age, has sort of become, you know, not very long ago, we were sort of over the hill. Uh, and suddenly, still being able to say, you know, I I'm going to run with the pack. And, and I might not run as fast, but I'll keep running. Okay. It's a good thing. Yeah, and yeah. and um, so, yeah. I, I hope we keep doing lots of like really cool stuff. Brilliant. Amazing. Well, look, guys, as I said, we'd have a bit of a different show tonight, but massively inspiring from you too. So thank you so much for coming on episode thank nine. You, really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys. Thanks so much for coming out. Also, everyone that tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in and watching the show. We'd also like to thank our sponsors yet again. Sage, thank you so much for sponsoring the show. Also, thank you so much, WeWork, for allowing us doing the show here. Also, thank you to everyone for coming along. Thank you so Huge much. Huge round of applause. Thank you so much, guys. Also, if anyone wants to come to another show, we've got the last show of the season that we're going to record in Dublin, right? So we're in Dublin, the 21st of March. If you want to come along, you can register below. We'll see you in Dublin, Dublin Landings in WeWork. See you guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it.